Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again, and this time we are here with Kelly of the Almighty Atheist. Thank you so much for being here, man. Great to have you here. My absolute pleasure, Alex. Thank you, man. Anytime, Appreciate man. It. Anytime. There's so much to celebrate in the Atheist camp today. I kind of wanted to uh, discuss this first, but this year marks 30 years of Elements, which is a fantastic album, and I know that this was the last Atheist album before, you know, you guys would go away and then later return with Jupiter in 2010. So starting with the Elements aspect, what was the sort of mind frame going into the making of Elements, and what did you guys kind of know that that would have been the last Atheist album for the foreseeable future? Honestly, after Unquestionable Presence, in my mind, I thought we were done. I thought that, um, you know, when Steve left and went to college and quit, I, I was just, you know, kind of back then you have to understand that the talent pool in metal was a bit of a puddle and, uh, and not a pool. And so it's very difficult to replace somebody like Steve Flynn back then. So it wasn't even in my mind that it was possible. So I actually started my other band, Neurotica, at that point. And uh, just because I, it was just very frustrating back then. And uh, I try to explain it to people that are under. 40 like what it was like for to be atheist back then and uh it certainly was not the landscape that we have today where where you know technicality and progression is is embraced and um certainly that was not the case back then and un unquestionable presence was was a, a bit of a, a mouthful for for people you know i mean um and so anyway i i uh, had already started writing for this new band and i was in the studio and we you know we got word that uh hey Still, I still have another record to do. So to me, I, I always love things like that, like a challenge. I said, well, oh, okay. Uh, and we only had literally a month, a little we had 40 days as, as the story goes, uh, from the first riff to the final mix. So um, everything about that record was very uh, unknown and, and um, uh, not thought about, not uh, overbaked, so to speak. And uh, that's kind of the, the beauty of that record is that it's, it is 100% honest. I mean, that is that is where we were. Uh, you know, Tony Troy played a, a really big role in, in helping me sort of expedite through, you know, sort of new members and 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 just you know trying to make a record without Steve Flynn. And uh, he was really instrumental in working with the drummer on uh, and keeping it interesting. And um, obviously, a lot of Latin vibe went into that just as a result of the rhythm section. So um, so I guess that's the the long answer <laughs> no we didn't we didn't we didn't really see i, I apologize I, it's I hard it. to tell tell stories about atheists because they all are uh you know they're involved there's so much time behind it now and uh so i try to give a short answer but it's hard to i love so that's i appreciate the long answers as, a, as an interviewer <laughs> nothing is worse than being like two minutes into the interview and already being on like your six or seven <laughs> questions so I'll, I'll never be guilty of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i appreciate but, it yeah. I, I think there's something yeah. about death metal where i always get the best answers like every time i interview like a death metal band that's been around for quite a time i always get the best answers immolation cannibal core suffocation always get the best answers so i think it's nice you know because we don't you know, this kind of music isn't appreciated on a mass level the same way that sort of rock and roll is. And I think there's an entitlement to, to rock bands where they feel like, oh, you know, you should be you should be interviewing me. And, I'll, I'll, you know, I we I think we all appreciate just anybody asking us about our, our travels and our path, you know, because uh, every van has uh, has a story. <laughs> Absolutely. And you guys, I've always said that Atheist is almost kind of like the thinking man's death metal band in a way because of like the different uh, pun intended elements that are brought up on uh, your records. Like when you compare like uh, elements to like your comeback record, Jupiter, and you uh, compare Peace of Time to Unquestionable Presence, it always seems like that they're, it's very thought provoking. It's brutal, you know, it gives me the same catharsis and energy that, uh, you know, all the death metal bands do. But there's also a lot of thought that goes into it. Was Atheist always approaching things from like a conceptual standpoint? Like, cause you know, with like the Elements record, you know, you have songs that are, you know, sort of like Elements with fire and mineral, animal, air, etc. So have you always approached things from a conceptual standpoint, kind of like how Mastodon does it, where like you think of a concept in mind and that could help guide your hand with regards to how you write? Quite the contrary. Um, you know, Elements uh, ended up being that way uh, purely as a challenge. And again, with the small amount of time that we had, uh, that's that's sort of how that came to be. And that's completely different from, from Unquestionable and Peace of Time. Whereas I typically write lyrics and then and then have my song title after I've written the lyrics. So I kind of I kind of um, combust 
and then I go back and review what, what it, try to figure out what it is that I'm, I'm talking about or what I'm trying to say. And, uh, and that's how those, the first two records sort of came together lyrically. Um, Elements was completely different. So it was, uh, you know, with the short amount of time that we had to put everything together, there wasn't a lot of time to, uh, to live with the music, to write the lyrics the same way that I did with the other two. And again, that was for me exciting. And uh, I love to be put on the spot. I love to not have to, to think twice about anything. And, and, um, and that was the case with that. And, uh, you know, Rand, Rand, myself and Rand were riding to the studio and we were just like, yeah, you know, uh, it'd be kind of cool to, to have song titles, uh, you know, that, that fall under the elements, you know? And I was like, all right, well, from a lyrical standpoint, that's gonna be really tough, <laughs> you know, to write a song about mineral and, and uh, earth and air, water, you know what I mean? Like, you know, when you, when you really break it down to try to, um, to try to make it interesting, you know, I never had preconceived song titles. So I, you know, I was a little uncomfortable with that, but that uncomfortableness led to some of my favorite lyrics that I've ever written. Yeah. So uh, I think it's good to put yourself on the spot. I think it's, it's a lot like, um, you know, in sports, when there's a big game, people kind of either rise to the occasion or they fall by the wayside. And I, I've always been lucky enough to, uh, you know, when poked in the chest artistically, I, I can uh, I can deliver. Uh, so I'm really proud of that record. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, and rise to the occasion. I mean, hey, it could have been, uh, you know, at least I was thinking, you know, you know, you would write song titles like Rubidium and Lithium and Bromine and Mercury and make it really <laughs> like a, a song for every a, a song for every uh, a, a element. That would have been really fucking table. hard. <laughs> hey, hey, if you if you could do that, you you outdone every <laughs> band that's yeah. out there. That's a challenge. Uh, you know, one thing I've noticed with death metal, and I know that it does exist, but I've noticed that, like, you know, like Cannibal Corpse, you know, they write about, you know, like the horror movie, the apocalyptic, you know, sort of zombie-esque aspect of lyrics. Deicide is more uh, rooted in Satanism and whatnot. Obscura writes about space, time, matter, and the universe. Um, has there ever been a time for you where your personal life and your personal experiences played a role in how you wrote the music and how you came up with the lyrics? Or was Atheist always a means of escapism where you didn't really want to bring everyday life into it? No, I can honestly say that I don't think there's one Atheist song, uh, aside from Jupiter. On Jupiter, I did it actually. It was the first time I ever approached anything uh, personal and wrote lyrics about it. There's a song called... Um, fictitious glide that was about uh where i where i think it's probably one of the only songs where i kind of i try to be clever about it so it's not super obvious because i've always been a fan of of lyricists like neil Peart and, and, and people that are are able to tell a story with different you know in a different way you know there's a there's a simple way to tell stories and then there's a clever way and i love words and wordplay and and um so i think that uh that was probably the only time that that's ever happened on the first two records um you know i i, I think well you know they're, they're, i'll talk about real life you know things that happen obviously we've covered you know, politics religion stuff like that but but uh but never personal until jupiter that was the only time that I ever really dove into something that was happening in my life and found a way to to uh to incorporate it without it being you know because you think about it you know in, in extreme metal it's it's very hard to uh to show um that kind of emotion like if you're going through something i don't know not, not just a breakup or a you know the end of a marriage or the loss of a family member or something like that you, you know you could be either pain, you know painfully obvious about it or or, or clever and uh, so i never found my personal experience never found a way to write about it that i felt comfortable but uh, you know i just felt like it was just too literal and um so yeah i try to uh again just lyrics are are just like the same way i write music i i just I don't I don't think about it. I don't I just it just happens and then I don't I, you know I, I really love the idea of not reviewing it not overthinking it you know because usually the first or second thing that you think of is usually the best idea <laughs> and then what happens is other people sort of chime in and then you start second guessing yourself and, you, and the next thing you know you've, you've you've fallen way away from you know your original intent and uh, that's always been my template is to try to just uh, be be spontaneous, you know, and uh, and usually the best stuff comes that way, and uh, that's that's how it's been for me. Other people have different processes that I um, I don't know that I envy them, but I you know I wish that I could tap into them, you know, where I could really kind of dig into you know be incredibly personal. Um, you know, I think pop music sort of allows for that more than than metal, 
I think um, metal is always sort of geared around fantasy and, and uh, sort of non-fiction, not non-fiction, but you know, you just you're able to kind of cover a lot more topics yeah. with metal than you can with with pop music. <laughs> Absolutely, which is something I love about it, you know, like a one minute, like, I've always said that, like, you go to, like, a metal, if you were to go to, like, a metal record store, it is almost kind of like a movie, uh, like, store in a way where there's the fantasy section, there's the horror section, there's the, yeah. there's the political documentarial section, there's um, the romance uh, section where all the metalcore bands would be, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and type <laughs> negative, but, uh, but, um, <laughs> But, you know, so I, I think that's amazing. And you kind of led me into, like, this next question. This is sort of like a debate I like to have with artists in a way because do you believe inspiration is something that could be sought out where, like, you know, like, I, I'd imagine, you know, there was maybe some research or other mediums of art used to explore your lyrical aspects. So is inspiration something that could really be sought out or is that just something that has to strike you? Uh, for me, it has to strike me. Um, I, you know, perhaps it's different with others, but I, I feel like... Uh... You know, there's a lot of things that make me mad. I'm a guy that I'm a guy that yells at the television. Um, you know, I'm I, I'm a guy that yells at a newspaper article or, or a, uh, an online article. Things make me angry and um, and frustrated and and you know, and sometimes shocked and and uh, especially these days. So I really look forward to writing a new atheist record because uh, I feel like it's going to be really easy. You know, it's been uh, it's, it's going to be easy lyrically to to come up. It'll be hard for me actually to condense myself. Because uh, there's just been a lot of things in the last uh, since 2010, the last time we made a record, uh, that you know that have gotten under my skin, and uh, and then you know what I, I tell, I have this conversation with my mother all the time. She's shocked at at the state of of uh, this country, and and you know between uh, religious indoctrination and and the way that it's sort of infiltrating schools, and and these are all things that I tell my mom. I was like, you know, back when I was 16 and 17, and you were. You're terrified that I was going to become a, you know, this evil little Satanist, you know, what I mean? which was completely the opposite. She just, you know, it's what standard people think when they hear the atheist. They think, oh, you don't believe in God, so you must believe in the devil. And it's like, <laughs> no, my, you know, my mom is a country woman. She's very um, simple that way. And so she was just confused as to what it was that was making me angry. And uh, so now as an adult, you know, a much older adult, she, she understands me. Uh, so much more now and I was like yeah I was very fucking angry about that at 17 18 years old um, and it's still around today but it's even worse today and it's you know a lot of a lot of the things that I, I feel like I was talking about back then uh, have come to fruition and, and uh, you know, all the things that I worried about and then that I wrote about um, have are really starting to rear their heads and it's it's, uh, it's frustrating as a person that doesn't isn't a slave to a denomination you know well, I've always said like um, that death metal music really has their lyrics have aged so well. Like when you look at the world of AI right now, I think Fear Factory predicted plenty of that in the day. Yeah. And you look at so much. I've always said that when like you know a hundred years from now, when they make documentaries on the modern times, the way that like the swing music was for World War II, you know, you hear all mm -hmm. that like Andrew Sisters and stuff. Death metal is going to be the soundtrack for every documentary we see when we look back on the 2020s. If we make it that far where there is documentaries but yeah. <laughs> what 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 i find fascinating obviously it's very cathartic to unleash this anger uh in the music and all these things that piss you off but when anger and you know the rather negativity is sort of like the fuel behind your fire does that maybe make the songwriting process just as deteriorating as it can can be cathartic do you almost feel like it's almost like torturing yourself in the name of art um i don't feel that way no i don't um I'm a little confused. What do you mean? So, do, the things that happen around me, yeah, do they do they deteriorate my ability to write music? Is maybe, that what you're yeah, yeah. Or does it maybe make the songwriting process stressful more so than it could be cathartic? Like, because no, yeah. there's never a moment that I'm stressed about writing. Writing songs to me is like <sighs> like a deep, like a deep breath, you know, and and um, and, and it sort of helps me get to the next breath. I mean, for me personally, I. I don't ever find it's very difficult to ever find a moment where I can't sit down and write something. Um, I, I literally sit down at least five nights a week now um, and write. And uh, what the, the beauty of today's technology is that I'm able to sit by myself, put all my ideas together, and uh, even drums and everything uh, in in a different kind of headspace than being in a warehouse uh, or a garage with four other people all making noise, tuning their guitars, 
um, you know, making noise, drums got to be, you know, constantly playing, everything's loud and tense. That also creates a really nice um, sort of, uh, for me anyway, that, that tenseness is what created Atheist, really. I mean, we, we really, back in the day when we were writing songs, we would fight, you know, we would argue and, and fight about uh, about riffs and about things and, and and what you can do and what you can't do because back then there, was, there wasn't really a template for uh, what we ended up doing. Uh, you know, I, I remember having conversations with, with band members about, well, you can't really just, you know, you can't just go from that part to that part and then back to that part. I'm like, why? Why can't we? There's no rules in music. We can do whatever we want. We can go from a from a bossa nova to a to a fucking thrash beat. You know what I mean? And then back to you know. I mean, you're allowed to do that. There's no riff police are going to come and take us to jail. You know, it's like a, and that's the beauty of music is that there are no rules in art too, as well, painting and and all kinds of art. There's no rules, and uh, as soon as you kind of accept that and, and allow yourself to to operate and and you know within that headspace. I think that it becomes really, really easy. So for me, I've never had anything stand in the way of writing, if anything, uh, you know, that, that frustration and all the different scenarios that I've written in have, have all um, catered to whatever I was writing. So for instance, I, you know, I have a, a brand new band called Till the Dirt and I, um, during COVID, I was locked down and, you know, uh, I, I had a four year old at the time. And so my wife would work at night. And so that atmosphere created you know, being stuck at home, not being able to go out and do anything. Uh, I had a DAW, you know, a little home studio set up. And just that um, unsureness of what was happening in society and what was going on. And me personally, I thought, you know, I, I, I lost a, uh, several friends during that COVID thing, the people that were way healthier than me. So there's also a small feeling of urgency, like, shit, you know, uh, I, I might get taken out. You know, I mean, I, I have been smoking 30 years, you know, there's all these respiratory issues. And in my head, I thought, oh my God, you know, maybe this is it, maybe I've only got a short amount of time. So I, I felt this urgency and I started writing and I wrote like 20 songs in six days or six weeks and, and uh, you know, put them all together and demoed them and uh, to, to what would become this, this album that I get ready to put out on Nuclear Blast uh, from Till the Dirt. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the situations and conditions definitely apply to how you write but they've never been a deterrent to me. That, anyway. That's amazing. I, I feel like you're able to use your anger more as an armor rather than an anchor, which I think is uh, very admirable. I think that's like a goes to show that not only is like d death metal such like a thought provoking and, you know, technically impressive, but it is like an inspiration in a way. I think it's very inspiring it's a, to show. It's a shame that it's a shame. I think that more people aren't familiar with the lyrical content of a lot of metal. It's, it's actually, you know, I learned, I, I know me and my friends learned a lot from bands like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, especially Iron Maiden. I probably learned more about world history from Iron Maiden than I did in, in high school. You know what I mean? Just like, what is the rhyme of the ancient mariner? You know, like, what is that? Uh, um, you know, um, uh, there's so many Maiden songs that, that turn me onto words and phrases and situations that I wasn't even aware of. You know, Genghis Khan, you know, all these different even Transylvania, like, what is Transylvania? You know what I mean? When you're young and you're like 14, you know, 13, 14 years old, like, well, what is that? You know, what is Genghis Khan? And so I, I, I honestly, like, um, you know, I think that I, people automatically think that when they hear the ferociousness of, of death metal and extreme metal, that they associate it with negative lyrics. And it's definitely not always the case. Not, and, and I wouldn't even say it's even the case half the time. Um, you know, obviously some people want to go for a shock value and, uh, but still within that shock value realm, there's a lot of, uh, great vocabularies and, uh, and a lot of twisted, interesting thoughts and, you know, that are, that are provoking and, and, um, and insightful, I think, you know, uh, Definitely. but I think that, that gets, it gets kind of washed away by people going, Oh, I, I don't listen to that devil music. You know, and I, I can't understand anything they're saying, you know. Well, it's a shame. Yeah. You, know, you should read the lyrics. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, like, you know, without a doubt, it's a darker form of music. So, you know, I could see, you know, and I do think it is an acquired taste. You know, I'm not going to expect somebody who's, you know, whose favorite artist is Katy Perry to all of a sudden pick up a Dying Fetus album and, you know, embrace it. Like, I feel like, but... But guess, you know what, though? I mean, like, movies, for instance, cinematically, um, if I'm a filmmaker, if I'm Quentin Tarantino... Or, or, or an edgy filmmaker. I mean, I'm, I'm using some of these powerful sounds 
for for some of these epic scenes that, that are being filmed obviously today with netflix and all these different platforms there's a lot more film being made and a lot more and television shows as well and i think one of the greatest things you could do is pair music with a with an incredible cinematic moment and i think that so many directors are missing the boat on really making their their um their vision of what they're filming uh even more powerful than they could ever imagine because to them the bank of music is is this you know and and really what's available is is you know and i don't think that you know because it's such an underground me you know medium that uh that that that's i, I wish that somebody would make a movie because i feel like you know a guy like quentin tarantino if some if i were to go and have drinks with him one night I, this is the first thing that i would say to him is like you have to put think about gojira in a movie think about like the the art of dying you know a song like that there's so many moments in that song that are just fucking epic man that would that would and, and if you if you couple that with a with a fight scene even if it's a, a you know a viking movie or i mean speaking of vikings i'm on a mark yeah great example of a band that could easily fit into a soundtrack in a movie um and people would be like what is that i've never heard anything like that for us it's normalcy yeah but for the for, for the layman it's like you know holy shit that's 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 really heavy and it's like well yeah, amount of martha's heavy but i can show you 10 bands that are even heavier yeah. <laughs> you know and uh you know even even on a modern level you know a band like lorna shore i think you know what what that kid's doing is is unbelievable you know i mean uh he's really moved the needle on extreme metal singing and i have to tip my hat to that guy there's a lot of people that want to talk shit about him because he's in a band with core at the end of it you know what i mean uh, but uh I, I you know i i look at it like this man it's a big tree and there's a lot of us that were the the, the tree trunk and there's a lot of branches on that tree and i'm you know i'm all for trees with branches uh, you know what i mean I, I, don't, I don't want to see a big you know tree trunk with no branches on it <laughs> i think that uh if you're able to grow a tree and and, and it's able to blossom you know uh, with branches and flowers and, and leaves then you've done a good thing and i think that now 40 years into this music uh, total um you know 30 for us and 40 for the you know for the genre uh there's so much history and um so many different um you know I, I wish the story was told a little better by books there are several books out these days that they kind of map the the path that got us here but um but not enough you know yeah. so i really like I, I i think that i wish that uh there was a way to get to uh some filmmakers you know and, and if one i think if one mainstream filmmaker gets turned on to um to this art form i think that they would be way ahead of of their of their peers you know in terms of really making an impactful scene you know i'm on a marth music for instance back to them you know all these viking movies and all these viking shows and then you know sometimes you hear like a i don't know an imagine dragon song like i don't want to fucking hear an imagine dragon song that's not that's not getting a point across for me yeah like what i'm what my eyes are seeing and what my ears are hearing doesn't doesn't go together as well now on the flip side of that i think that um i was watching yellowstone and i heard um a pucifer song Ooh. and it's not a heavy song but it's uh but i i forget what it was called um something about crossing the river or whatever but really really intense song but but done in a dark way not metal but done in a you know in just a not a pop way it's not happy it's very sullen and and uh man it really made this particular scene in yellowstone um sons of anarchy used to use certain songs as well um i think there's a sound garden song that got used in one of the scenes that it was a, a like a car chase scene a motorcycle scene and that fucking song just like made that that scene you know and so on that tip i wish that uh we had more opportunities yeah. to uh to see to see uh extreme music in, in cinema yeah. yeah i wish uh it, uh kind of a different uh, uh speaking of different analogies but um i saw a movie very underrated film called law-abiding citizen one time and uh, there's a scene where a guy uses a steak bone to kill a guy shanks him in the neck and you just see the blood splatter everywhere but the way that it is is the second he uh hits the guy's neck engine number nine by deftones comes on and yeah. it just makes the whole scene 10 times more brutal and unsettling and it just it really i mean if i would have seen that scene as a little kid i probably would never eat another steak for the rest of my life but like uh i think it it added to that sort of uh absolutely brutality. think about rosemary the song rosemary from yeah. deftones you know it starts off this just really tranquil 
But then when it comes in, it's just monumentally heavy. And like, man, if you were to couple that with some visuals, it would be an epic scene. So I think that that's a that's uncharted territory that hopefully in the next ten years will. Uh, you know, I, I always think about like my son is six years old, and um, you know, there's things that happen today in commercial television, certain songs that you would never imagine would have laughed. Like I guarantee the people that wrote the songs 40 years ago never imagined that their song would be suitable in a I don't know an insurance commercial or, or a uh, a food commercial or, or whatever, and and have it apply in, in that way. And so I wonder if you know, long after I'm gone and my son is in his 40s, you know, if this kind of music. I don't know, becomes more uh, more uh, easily used in, in, in film, and that would be kind of cool, you know? I just Something that I wouldn't have wouldn't have anticipated. I would have hoped for, but I wouldn't have expected. I, so um, I'd love to see it happen before I go, but I, but uh, I, doubt, I doubt it. <laughs> I discovered Pantera thanks to SpongeBob, so, uh, you know. Really? Yep. Um, That's hilarious. Yeah, they played, a, it was Death Rattle on an episode, on a title card of the episode, and it said featuring musical guests Pantera. And it was just incredible. So I think that's a great way to expose music. I mean, um, you know, especially obscure music to, uh, you know, to, to mainstream people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the, because you're putting it in a different light. And they're not really thinking about, they're not looking at an album cover that they feel uncomfortable about. They're not looking at a song title that they feel uncomfortable about. They're just hearing the sounds, watching the visual, and putting those two things together. And in their mind, it moves them. Yep. And that's all that, that's all that it should ever be. People should only, you know, experience art that way. You know what I mean, and not and not get into the, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. Oh well, I, I I'm not supposed to like that. I don't, I don't like that kind of music. Yeah. I, I mean, I love all kinds of music. I, I I find you know Billie Eilish to be amazing. She's incredible. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I can't I can't say enough about her. And I I always I, I hate the segregation that that I think I think people that are into metal for the first five years feel like. It, it needs to be segregated. Like I'm into, I'm into thrash core, or I'm in a, I'm in a gore core, or whatever. You know, everything has to be a, a fucking category. And uh, I think once you're into metal for a while, and you realize that it's not just something you're into. It's a, it's a life, it's a, you know, it's a lifestyle. I don't know. Mo most metalheads I know have been metalheads forever. They didn't stop. You know, they just continued. But we also, once you get beyond that, then you you can recognize other kinds of music. Now, I, I I really hate country music. But there is, I really like old country guitar players. So, um, so I find something, and almost in all kinds of music, except for opera, I just can't, still to this day, I cannot understand how, uh, I mean, I can appreciate the, the storytelling uh, and the, and the uh, acrobatics Flush, vocally. Flush got Apocalypse. Do you listen to them yet? Uh, not knowingly, no. Okay. Uh, maybe you could appreciate a little bit of opera incorporated in there. Yeah, I just, um, well, it's, uh, I would certainly, I think if somebody, yeah, if were to weave it into a, uh, into something that at least gives me a little bit of, uh, edginess and angst, it just seems so, uh, it's, it's a, it's a feeling in a space in my brain that I don't ever have. So when I hear opera, I think, ah, I don't know, I don't know how to get my mind uh, around. Uh, first of all, I can never hear the story it's usually in italian or can't understand or in another, the lyrics. So, you know, i don't know what the fuck you're talking about maybe if i knew what you were talking about uh i don't see a lot of english spoken opera am i wrong no I'm no no you're mean. you're right about that 100 percent um it's uh it's i mean it's a very european in style fluids you want to you want to hear an interesting way to, for a gateway to opera you've heard of the band they're on metal blade called igor with three r's Oh, I love Igor. Okay, that's opera. Love that's Igor. Baroque opera incorporated in some of their songs on the album Savage Sinusoid. Uh, I guess you're right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, certainly with the female vocalist, um, you know, the the feeling that she emits, but it, it, it comes off as so much more, um, uh, I guess, you know, you're absolutely right. I guess it is opera. I mean, it falls into that world. And, and see, so there you go. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear Igor and go, oh, that's opera. I don't like opera. You know what I mean? Like, you, you don't want to do that or you miss out on a great band like Igor. You know, who I, I definitely is one of my, in, in the last couple of years, one of the, one, of the, one of the things that I heard that was like, wow, what the, is that? You know, and then, then I dove into that rabbit hole of, of their music, and I just, yeah, I thought they were just tremendous. I would kill. You know, I love band love band. finding bands like that, like that just you know that move vibrations differently. You know, they, they're just uh, they're definitely doing something you know unique. Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. it's cool. Yeah. You got time for two more questions? 
Absolutely, man. Uh, awesome. Yeah, uh, just because you're such a prolific artist between, you know, Atheist, this new project to the dirt you mentioned, but also Ravage and Neurotica. Is there a usual method behind the madness that applies to every project that you're involved with? Or, or does every project almost require a different approach or a different mindset? None of them are ever preconceived. So I think that, um, you know, none of the bands I can think of uh, I was in a band called Stones of Madness. Um, we did we did one record, and that was where the only time where I was not the songwriter, I was just the singer. So I wrote all the lyrics, but I was a friend of my name, um, Scott Thompson, who was in a band called Dry Kill Logic. In the oh, 90s. they're awesome! And, I interviewed them and, uh, in the lockdown. Oh yeah, yep. cool. So so Scott um, lives uh, south of me, and um, you know we met through mutual friends, and he had uh, this music, and when I heard it, I was like. Hmm, yeah, I could definitely, it's in my wheelhouse. Uh, and so that came together. That's kind of the only thing I've ever been a part of where I didn't have both hands on the wheel and, and uh, didn't have a, you know, sort of a say. And I liked that space where I was just like, just a singer. You know, I just, I heard his music and I reacted to it vocally and, and, and there it is. And it's really good. It was just, uh, you know, outside of the extreme world, it was more, it was more like neurotica, you know, it was more of a um, sort of hard rock as opposed to metal. And so my constituents and, and peers weren't as uh, weren't as open to it as uh, as they, you know. What I find oddly is that, you know, because I mean, I also did a, you know, I had a band with uh, Brian Johnson from ACDC, and, and um, it was a bunch of songs that he wrote, and uh, and he wasn't able to record them because obviously he was under contract with ACDC. So he calls me on the phone and says, you know, Kelly, me son, you know, will you will you fucking sing on a record, you know? Uh, I uh, wrote these fucking songs and, uh, you know, I'd like you to sing in a ring. I'm like, yeah, absolutely, Brian Johnson. I will completely <laughs> sing in your band. And, you know, uh, the fuck am I going to say? No. You know? uh, so that was another scenario where I was, well, that was even a different scenario where I was singing Brian's lyrics. And uh, the band was called Oddly Big Machine. That's what he wanted to put together. That was before there was a, a Velvet Revolver, which oddly, Velvet Revolver, I was almost the singer of Velvet Revolver. I don't know if you knew that or not. Really? Yeah. That's I, a, I know I mean, they could say weird. Sebastian. My career Bach. is so weird. Yeah, they could. could yeah, it was, they, but, well, it was it, honestly, it came to if you there's a an issue of Rolling Stone that has me and Sebastian and Travis, uh, Travis Meeks from um, Days, of, Days the of the New, and uh, Joshua Todd from Buck Cherry. I think Mike so those, Patton was also considered. So that's that's how Rolling Stone kind of um, depicted the story. Of the um, and, but I, you know, what really really happened is is Slash and those guys they. You know, they went through 600 sing. I mean, they were they were like spent weeks listening to singers, and and so I when when I heard that they were looking for a singer, I was uh, you know atheist. I hadn't you know gotten back together at that point. Um, we were kind of talking about doing some things, but but that was you know really outside my wheelhouse a little bit, but not really vocally. I, I felt like you know I could like Slash was looking for somebody that was like a real rock singer, and I remember being like put off by that like. Because he, he said, you know, there are no real rock singers around anywhere. I was like, fuck that. Yes, there are. Because I love that old David Lee Roth spirit of front men and, you know, guys that are just emceeing a rock show, you know. And uh, even Dee Snider, Twisted Sister, was a great front man. I love front men like that that just, that just make you be involved, you know. So I always felt that I had that quality. And I uh, so I called my manager at the time and I was like, hey, uh, we should send the Neurotic album out there. And... And he was very reluctant. He was like, "Yeah, you know, you're you're talking about Guns and Roses guys, dude. I mean, there's there's going to be a long line of people." And I was like, "Well, I just want to be one of them, you know. I mean, just send it out there." So, long story short, I I had remembered that uh, with Neurotica, we worked with a publicist. Her name was Lulu, and uh, she used to be Slash's publicist. And so I called her on the phone, and before I could even get it out, she was like, "Oh my God, yes, we'll send it to him." So she did. Uh, four days later, I get a call from Slash on the phone, and and the rest is history, man. I ended up going to LA and, and working on some songs with them, and 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 sort of left at that point with a with a real good shot at that gig. Yeah. And uh, that would have been really crazy, you know, pretty unprecedented for a death metal. Now I never mentioned anything about my death metal roots or or any of that with any of those guys, but but for for you know it was kind of fun to be. Uh, I felt like I was I felt like an imposter, kind of, you know, because I, I went out to LA and I'm I'm in this room with you know essentially Guns and Roses. It was like Guns and Kelly for a weekend, you know, and uh, it was it was fucking cool, man. And so we wrote three songs, and uh, and went in the studio with them, and so it was just a cool experience. But I, I can't remember why I was talking about that, but I think I was just talking about just doing different things. Yeah, but, yeah. But um, 
but yeah, I, uh, you know, when it comes to singing, um, you know, I, I uh, mostly have been involved so much that, you know, but those are the two bands that I, that I, I really was able to take, you know, at least somewhat of, uh, of a backseat to the process, you know, definitely. And the final question I wanted to ask you um, before we go, this is a question for all the listeners. Uh, so Jupiter, you know, the last Atheist album, I consider it to be the one of the best comeback albums in death metal next to Carcass's Surgical Steel. Thank you, man. Yep, like, Thank you. Yep, and, you know, At the Gates comeback album. It's definitely on that level of comeback albums that are just so good. What else can we be expecting for, if you're allowed to say, the new Atheist record in terms of the when, the where, the why, the how, the what, if you're allowed to say, of course. I think like any atheist record, you can expect it to not be like the other one. You know, I mean, all four records are very different with a common denominator in, um, I don't know, maybe uh, unexpectedness, you know? And um, so I think that, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess it maybe it's hard for me to, 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 to see them as different, but I don't know. How do you see it? I mean, I don't, I don't think we've made the same record twice. Not at all. You know, uh, I, so I think each of them have, you know, a different, different feel, different vibe to them. Um, you know, piece of time, we were very young, uh, just learning how to play. Uh, so half of that record is very immature musically. Uh, the other half is where we were kind of learning to play, you know, piece of time. I deny those two songs were kind of the, the last couple songs that we wrote for that album. And then on into unquestionable presence, which top to bottom is, is just, um, still to this day, uh, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of any moment on that record. <laughs> you know, that's hard to do because I mean, really you get. You know, I, I can't think of any other music that I've made where I, I, where I don't listen to one part and go, ah, fucking wish that was different. And Unquestionable was just, uh, it just came out so cool. Yeah, that's and I still love work. it. But, you know, that, that's your hard yeah, work still... in Jupiter's or Surgical Steel, the, the carcass reference. <laughs> I, um, but I think that you can expect us to, um, to try to, again, m move the boulder, as I say, you know, like so many people lean on the rock, you know, they lean on the boulder, they sit on it, they do it. Nobody moves that shit, and, um, and I think that that's something that Atheist has always managed to do a little bit up with each record is fucking move it. You know, now that now what? Now what do we do? Um, one of the things that I've always uh, said over the past few years to for this, you know, because right now you can't get any heavier, you can't get any faster, like you just can't. You know, I mean, it's it's as heavy as it. You know, so 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 now what? Now you know you take all these these tools of heaviness the the brutal vocals, the speed that the drummers play it, you know, the way drummers play now compared to the nineties is just fucking night and day. Listen, you know, the, the possible, yeah, the possibilities are just staggering. And, uh, even bass players, you know, um, when we started, Roger Patterson was a, an anomaly of, you know, a, a real, like nobody, there were just maybe three or four bases that really stuck out like that, you know, back then now, Jesus, like, you know, you can go see a local band with a with a stunning bass player, you know, and uh, so it, it makes me proud because it just really, I think bands like us and Cynic really uh, just showed, I, I think it takes somebody to kind of, you know, be daring and put it out there and, 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 uh, and then everybody realizes that, okay, okay. And then they take it and put their own spin on it. And now here we are, you know, 20 years into, or 30 years into progressive metal and uh, yeah, the, the musicianship is just off the charts. Yeah. And so, so I have to think about it as a writer. I think, well, what else can I do differently? Well, I can write. I can write songs really good. So if I could, if I could, you know, if anything, I don't like to pre, sort of, pre think about what I want to do. But I know that my philosophy now is definitely about catchiness. And I think it's a really important part of any kind of music that you write. How do you make somebody retain it, you know, and, and continue to retain it? And um, so one of my biggest complaints about today's metal is just this barrage of chaos. And it's like that chaos would seem even more chaotic with dynamics. You know, if you, if you're always going 120 miles an hour, it's, it, it eventually doesn't feel like 120 miles per hour until you go and get stuck at a red light. Yeah. You know, if you're stuck at a red light or if you're in traffic. So the difference between traffic and 120 miles an hour is what excites me. That's what makes me aware of each of those uh things i fucking hate sitting in traffic and it makes me angry i love going really fast so those two emotions uh, are um inflated by each other and i think musically that needs to happen yeah. um a lot and i hear so many bands that are just man they're just killing it killing it killing it and then it's just it never it never moves away from that and, uh, and then there's other bands that um that do get it and they'll they'll come away from it i mean igor 
Igor is a, is a great example of, you know, they're going, 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 poof, right? And just on a dime, go into a different headspace. And Arch I Spire. love that. I think Arch Spire. What's that? Uh, Arch Spire. You ever listen to them? Yeah. So, that, so, that's good... so that's a band that, that, uh, I have to listen to a little bit more of because what I've heard is, is so chaotic, really just off the charts, amazing, uh, musicianship, uh, I, I, I don't even know how they pull all that shit off live. You they're know not, I mean? they're subhuman, those guys. The bass player's doing hammer-ons like it's a freaking guitar. The, the, that's, just that's amazing. Riffs. The, the drum, and, and you know what's funny is they're, the, again, one of the most technically impressive bands from the vocals to the rhythm section, all that. They are the goofiest, funniest guys. Like, they never take, I've interviewed them a handful of times, awesome guys. You'll never get a moment of seriousness for them. It's like you'll see like the most serious, like nerdy musicians just seething with anger on how they're able to pull that off and laugh their whole way through it. Those guys are, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I mean, for atheists, uh, for so many years, people, well, I don't know if you've ever seen us live or not, but I mean, it's I not that. what you would expect. Uh, I think a lot of people expected us to be like very like that, like nerdy and and sort of uh, in lab coats and. Uh, you know, serious, and and we just kind of come out like, you know, like a like an arena rock band, but you know, performing and executing all all the crazy parts, and and I think that that you know that's fun. That's what a live experience should be about. But anyway, it's it's good to see that that those guys uh, don't take themselves too seriously, and and that but they can be you know mind blowing musically. Yeah. But I'll have to listen. I I haven't heard any dynamic stuff from Mars. But of course, I'm all, I'm seeing clips and things like that. But I'll I'll dig into that and check it out. But what I heard on like liquid metal and stuff like that it's just like wow. yeah wow you know what i mean but but it also leads me to say okay now what now now what do we do um how much better can you how much faster how much you know how many more scales can you play out how, how much faster there's a double bass you know the blasting all that super impressive tip of the hat totally about it it's just um i just want things to be a little catchier you know what i mean I just want a better songwriting mm-hmm. so i guess in in closing that would be something that i'm going to shoot for if i had to pick um, you know, something I really wanted to accomplish with a, with a new atheist record is songwriting. It's still going to be chaotic, but chaotic in and in a, in somehow in a way that people can sort of, you know, rest their chin on and, and uh, you know, and hopefully have longevity with that as well. But it's never good to premeditate music. I think that that's the worst thing you can ever do. But uh, but it is something I think about, you know, just I think that by, by default, as a songwriter, I've written so many songs in the last four decades that I've gotten better at it you know what i mean so now i'm able to apply that i did learn a lot from neurotica and working with big name producers um, that world really helped me when i came back to extreme metal um to apply those philosophies and you know i got to work with kevin shirley who, who does all the iron maiden stuff now and, and he was really uh, an eye-opening um addition to my influence you know he was just you know uh, just really took me to places I wouldn't normally go and, and, uh, and explain things to me in a way that, that, uh, that, that really made sense. And I was able to use those, those reprimands, so to speak, you know, because he was, you know, a no nonsense. We had just signed with the WWE and, you know, he is already a Grammy award winning guy. And so I came in with my attitude of how things were going to be. And he was just like, wash, here's how, here's how life really is Kelly. And I was like, Oh shit, you know, you're right. And, uh, and I love, I love being wrong. I tell people that all the time. They think, well, you, think you're right all the time i don't want to be right all the time i love being wrong because it just means i got smarter you know uh, because i was wrong all that time now now i've learned now my snowball's bigger you know i mean and that's how you go through life i think uh so i i, I loved being wrong around kevin Shirley. he was he was brilliant and um put me in my place and taught me a lot of things and brian johnson i mean fuck i did all my vocals for the neurotic album that we did together with him sitting behind the glass and uh, having him in my earphones, like while I'm doing vocals, was like this, it was so bizarre and so surreal. But he also pulled no punches. Like, you know, uh, you know, if I if I did a vocal take that was weak, he was like, "Fucking sing like a fucking man, Kelly. Sing like a fucking man." Oh, I was, I was, yes, sir. I was fucking sing like a man. Uh, sing, you know, sing like a man, but not like an angry man. You know, all those kinds of things, you know, that cause you to think about how you're doing your vocals and how you get yourself to to a space to get that take that you're looking for you know and uh so i, I really and those guys have been able to work with the greatest of you know of people as well and so i i love working with you know smarter people i love also i've always said that uh everybody i've ever been in a band with is a better musician than me you know and i really enjoy that i, I don't i don't want to play with people that uh, aren't 
as good. Like I want to play with people that are better than me all the time. I want everybody in my band to be, to be better than me. So my, you know, my new drummer and atheist is a better guitar player than me. I like that. You know, I think that's really cool. And um, so anyway, I, I just think if you surround yourself with that kind of, you know, where you're constantly reaching, trying to keep up with everything as opposed to being complacent and feeling like the, the most talented guy in the room, I don't want to be the, I don't, I feel like that would be going backwards to be the most talented guy in the room. Yeah. What I am good at is is taking that talent and weaving it together. And and, uh, and that's something that I, that I can kind of hang on to in, in my in my uh, sadness that I didn't end up as great of a musician as guys like Art Spire. And, <laughs> you know, you watch these kids like, holy shit, man. There's not a day in my life I'll ever be able to play guitar hey, like that. To everybody watching and listening to Art Spire, those guys are not human, okay? I'm the journalist. I interview them. Those guys are from outer space or something like that. So, like, uh, you, you, no, need, no need to be ashamed. <laughs> but you know what's funny about technicality and, and um, something I've learned from having to pull in new, new, new band members is that you know, atheist is like this, you know, obviously we don't play, you know, the, the, back then it was very uh, eye-opening and jaw-dropping compared to today. Like if you're 19 years old and you hear atheist, you think, man, eh, it's not that tactical. Well, then you should try to play it because, uh, you know, behind all that speed, when you've got to slow down and you've got to groove and you've got to, and then you've got to shift gears from a groove to, to chaos, to you start going through all these things it's deceivingly technical we're technical in a, in a different way that i think not a lot of people realize until they actually sit down and try to learn it and uh, that's what i found from all the newer guys that i'm playing with because uh, you know the new guys in a band are all 25 to, to 30 years old and um you know the music is older than they are and um really just but uh, great musicians and you know guys that graduate berkeley you know with, with tons of skills and chops struggle you know with with uh with playing certain atheist songs and um and I, so it's so it's um you know kind of kind of different technicality isn't always blazing speed and and um and and tons of different parts put together you know sometimes this the most subtle part can be really difficult uh, to pull off i also learned that on a flip of that is uh i used to honestly i used to kind of chuckle at acdc drums back when i was a teenager and i first started playing metal i used to be like oh give me a break my mom can play those drums you know <laughs> Well, my, my mom cannot play eight minutes of Let There Be Rock. Like, I learned when I got older, like, for eight minutes, rock solid is fucking really, really hard. Right. So I was stupid. I was naive, you know. I, I thought, ah, you know, that shit's simple. So uh, so on that tip, you know, I, uh, you know I, I, I'm happy that I'm always learning and always appreciating. And, and uh, that's, all, that's, that's all you can do as a human being, just try to absorb and grow, you know. And, Absolutely, man. And be wrong. Of it's course. Be wrong. Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> well, but, uh, you know, I want to say real quick that uh, we, we have a lot of uh, the reissues are coming out. Okay. Um, and um, and so they're going to be available starting uh, next week. So we signed a, uh, brought our catalog. Uh, we've been, our catalog hasn't been available for three years. And uh, so I'm excited about that. Just in closing, if, I, if you don't mind, no. just let everybody know that uh, these new reissues are on Nuclear Blast. They did a fantastic job uh, putting new artwork and, so they're they're different than any other of the of the records that we put out, and um, and I'm excited about being involved with Nuclear Blast on this because uh, you know Monty Connor is a guy that I've known for 30 plus years. He was, you know, uh, he had a radio show in college. Like we all kind of came up together, and um, and so being reunited with him, and um, and also my new band Till the Dirt. Scott Burns produced that record with me. So you know who Scott Burns is. You know that it's a he hasn't he hasn't produced a record in over 25 years so uh really excited and that's also a nuclear blast so really excited to be under that umbrella and um and hopefully in the future well, you know we'll be able to uh do some atheist over there as well but they were they were great about you know uh, taking on the catalog and doing a, a really fantastic job of creating something different so we're going to be doing splatter vinyl and all that so watch for that uh, announcement in the next couple of days and um i think it comes out july 14th officially uh, that's when it ships but you can pre-order starting April 14th. I think it is. Sounds good. Well, thank you. It's so my plug. Much. Thank you. Hell yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, Kelly, Alex. For such an awesome I appreciate it, brother. Everybody, Kelly of the Almighty Atheist, new reissues coming Cheers. soon. Be on the lookout. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time. Cheers.